Well, good morning everyone, uh, class 10. Now if you remember, the last video I put up, we were doing the eighth chapter from your text, First Flight, titled Midge Bill, the Author. And if you happen to look at the chapter, you'll see that it has four parts into which the story has been broken into. And in the last video, I had covered two. In the last video, we had to do a short recap of it our narrator has got an otter for a pet all right and he felt that the surrounding that he was living in would be perfect for him to keep an otter as a pet and it was all right he was enjoying his time with it he got the otter to his place in Camusferna, which had a large water body at the back side of where he was living and so it wasn't very hard for the otter Otter to adapt to its surroundings and now we cover the third and the final that is the fourth portion of the chapter starting from page 107 all right so the third part reading the text of Midgeville the Otter eighth chapter in your text first flight written by Gavin Maxwell the third chapter begins the days passed peacefully at Baswa but I dreaded the prospect of transporting Midge to England and to Camusferna. The British airline to London would not fly animals, so I booked a flight to Paris on another airline and from there to London. The airline insisted that Midge should be packed into a box not more than 18 inches square to be carried on the floor at my feet. I had the box made and an hour before we started, I put Midge into the box so he would become accustomed to it and left for a hurried meal. When I returned, there was an appalling spectacle. There was complete silence from the box, but from the, its air holes and chinks around the lid, blood had trickled and dried. I whipped the lock and tore open the lid and Midge, exhausted and blood spattered, whimpered and caught at my leg. He had torn the lining of the box into shreds when I removed the last of it so that there was no cutting edges left. It was just 10 minutes until the time of the flight and the airport was five miles distance. I put the miserable midge back into the box, holding down the lid with my hand. I sat in the back of my car with the box beside me as the driver tore through the streets of Basra like a ricocheting bullet. The aircraft was waiting to take off. I was rushed into it to it by infuriated officials. Luckily, the seat booked for me was at the extreme front. I covered the floor around my feet with newspaper, rang for the air hostess and gave her a parcel of fish for Midge to keep in a cool place. I took her into my confidence about the events of the last half hour. I have retained the most profound admiration for that air hostess. She was the very queen of her kind. She suggested that I might prefer to have my pet on my knee. And I could have kissed her hand in the depth of my gratitude. But not knowing otters, I was quite unprepared for what followed. So, now, the days passed peacefully at Basra. As long as he was in Basra, he was enjoying with Midge. All right? But now, it had come, uh, time had come for him to return to Camusferna through England. And he did not know how that animal would behave inside a flight. And while he was booking tickets, he was given instructions as to how he was to transport the pet. He was to put the otter inside a box, which should not be more than 18 square inches, all right, so that it doesn't take up much space. So he had the box made. And on the day he was supposed to travel, he put Midge the otter inside the box an hour before he was to leave so that the animal gets used to its new space. So then he went about doing his thing, uh, getting ready for the flight and all. But when he was, when he came back to see the box, he saw that Midge was very quiet. All right. The box was, uh, the box was very still and the animal was very quiet. And he could see that there were trickles of blood on the box which had dried up. So fearing the worst, he opened the box and saw 
Mitch, fully frightened, and Mitch jumped and hold on to. Mitch jumped on and he held on to a to our narrator's feet. All right, he was afraid of the confined space, and he could see that he was gnawing off. All right, he was trying to escape the box. He was afraid of the box, and so he smoothened out all the rough edges of the box so that it doesn't injure Mitch further. But then by the time he was done all this. It was just 10 minutes left, and he had to drive five kilometers to the airport. So he just stuffed in Midge inside the box, held the cover with his hands. All right, just held it with his hands. Got into the cab and drove five miles. And by the time he got there, thankfully the plane was still there. But all the officials were very infuriated because he was late. Thankfully, his seat was at the very front of the plane. All right, so he wouldn't be. Sorry. He wouldn't be disturbing anyone, and then he called the air hostess and gave the air hostess some fish. All right, it was supposed to be the otter's meal, and the air hostess on her part was very understanding, and he calls her the queen. All right, of kindness because she suggested, why don't you keep your pet on your lap? And he was very grateful to her, but then he wasn't prepared for what. Uh, or rather, how, uh, uh, he wasn't prepared about Midge's reaction inside the airplane. How the animal would react. Midge was out of the box in a flash. He disappeared at high speed down the aircraft. There were squawks and shrieks, and a woman stood up on her seat, screaming out, "A rat! A rat!" I caught sight of my Midge's tail disappearing beneath the legs of the portly white turbaned Indian. Driving for it, I missed, but found my face covered in curry. Perhaps," said the air hostess with the most charming smile, "it would be better if you resumed your seat, and I'll find the animal and bring it back to you." I returned to my sit seat. I was craning my neck, trying to follow the hunt, when suddenly I heard from my feet a distant, distressed chitter of recognition and welcome. And Mitch bounded onto my knee and began to nuzzle on my face and my neck. So as soon as he opened the box in the aircraft, Mitch jumped out and started running around. And the, all the other passengers were frightened. They started screaming. That one of the lady thought that it was a rat. Then Mitch ran in between the legs of a very healthy-looking, turban-wearing Indian fellow. And when our narrator tried to jump and catch Mitch. His face was covered in curry. At this point, the air hostess told him, "Why don't you take a seat? I will try and find the animal for you and get it to you. Don't worry about it." And so he got back to his seat, all the while worrying about whether Midge was found out or not. And at that very precise moment, he heard a very familiar chitter from beneath his seat, and it was Midge. He had came come back to his owner, and he started. To, or rather, he proceeded to sit on the owner's lap and then nuzzle my face and my neck. Now, the fourth and final part: Midge and I remained in London for nearly a month. He would play for hours with a selection of toys: ping pong balls, marbles, rubber foot, and a terrapin shell that I had brought back from his native marshes. With that ping pong ball, he invented a game of his own, which could keep him engrossed for up to half an hour at a time. A suitcase that I had taken to Iraq had become damaged on the journey home, so that the lid, when closed, remained at a slope from one end to the other. Mitch discovered that if he placed the ball on the high end, it would run down the length of the suitcase. He would dash around to the other end to ambush its arrival, hide from it, crouching, to spring up and play and take it by surprise, grab it and trot it off, trot off with it to the high end once more. Outside the house, I exercised him on a lead, precisely as he had been a dog. Mitch quickly developed certain compulsive habits on these walks in the London streets. Like the rituals of children who, on their way to and from to and from school, must place their feet squarely on the center of each paving block, 
must touch every seventh upright of the iron railings or pass to the outside of every second lamp post. Opposite to my flat was a single story primary school along whose frontage ran a low wall some two feet high. On its way home, but never on his way out, Midge would tug me to this wall, jump onto it, and gallop the full length of its 30 yard to the ho hopeless distraction both of pupils and of staff within. It is not, I suppose, in any way strange that the average Londoner should not recognize an author. But the variety of guesses as to what kind of animals this might be came as a surprise to me. Otters belong to a comparatively small group of animals called mustelins, shared by the badger, mongoose, weasel, stoat, mink, and others. I faced a continuous barrage of conjectural questions that sprayed all the mustelins, but the otter. More random guesses hit on a baby seal and a squirrel. Is that a walrus, mister? Reduced me to giggles. And outside, a dog show, I heard, a hippo, a beaver, a bear cub, a leopard one, apparently, that had changed its spots. But the question for which I was awarded the highest score, for which I awarded the highest score, came from a labor, laborer digging a hole in the street. I was still far from him when he had laid down his tool, put his hands on his lips and began to stare. As I drew nearer, I saw his expression of surprise and affront, as though he would have me know that he was not one upon whom to play jokes. I came abreast to him. He spat, glared, and then growled out, Here, mister, what is that supposed to be? And so, after a very uneven, or rather a very uh, active airline travel, he reached England, where he was to spend a month. And during his stay here, there, Midgeville had become more accustomed to the narrator. He used to play a lot of games. He used to play with the tennis ball. And one of the suitcases of the narrator had been damaged. All right, suitcase was done. Like one girl, the crazy, it turned this way. The whole length. If the suitcase was, shape of the suitcase was this, after, dam after being damaged, it turned this way. So that a slope was formed. And so what Midgeville used to do was, he used to sit here, let go of the ball, and as the ball was rolling along the length of the uh, suitcase, Majul would come to the other side and then pounce on the ball, take the ball back, again slide it towards, through the length of the suitcase. And then there were other things he did. He used to climb lamp posts, he used to uh, climb railings, and there was a school, a primary school, a one-story primary school. And every day, not going out, but coming back, Midge Bill used to run the length of the school to the surprise of all the students and the teachers as well. And all through his stay there, he began to learn more about the otter, all right? That otter belonged to a small group of animal called mustelins. And which uh, under this mustelin family came the badger, mongoose, weasel, slot, mink, and others. But then people got confused over the origin of Midgebill. They gave them very, uh, they gave Midgebill very random names, all right? They thought that Midgebill was a hippo to one, all right? Someone thought that it was a bear cub. Someone thought that it was a leopard's cub. Someone thought that it was a baby seal or a squirrel. He even heard absurdities such as, is that a walrus? But then even better than all these guesses were one question that was put up by a man, a laborer who was digging a hole, all right, in the street. So as he was walking Midgebill, the man saw the animal, he put his hand on his lips and then he stared. And then he gave an expression on his face which wasn't one of pleasure. He spat on the ground, he glared at the narrator and he asked him, Well, mister, 
what is that supposed to be and so here we end the end chap uh, eighth chapter as well now uh, if i remember correctly i have I've already given you the questions on page 106 all right which is for parts one and two now turning to page 108 you will find questions one to five and on page 110 one to four so i want you to attempt these questions as well i believe i've already given you the summary of the chapter and so you shouldn't be having any difficulty in answering this but even so if you do face any difficulty you know what to do you can call me or you can text me and i'll help you with whatever problem that may come through you going through this chapter all right sorry so please go through this chapter line by line read as i'm reading along as usual underline the difficult words and find its meaning and attempt the questions as well all right so i'll see you next time good day